He's especially concerned about the dangers posed by moral optimism because, to answer your question, he's convinced that's the doctrine upon which the United States was founded. Here's what he says on page 18. He says, um, the conception of human nature which underlies the social and political attitudes of a liberal democratic culture like ours is that of an essentially harmless individual. Later he calls a harmless individual the model for Americans a harmless egotist. Let's go back to the, uh, to the pilgrims coming here in 1620. Did you learn about them in school? Yeah, I learned about the, some pilgrims. I mean, like... You didn't learn about the pilgrims who came here from uh, Europe? I learned about them. They came on, like, the, called the Mayflower. Exactly, so you do know. They didn't have very much money. They couldn't hire a good boat. They couldn't hire a good crew. Well, in those days, in those days, in those days, it took um, over a month to sail from Europe to uh, America, oh, and it was well. a very hazardous voyage because not many people had done it. And then so, people were sick, and it was crowded. So, so it was easy yeah, us. yeah. The pilgrims who are fleeing Europe to ostensibly to gain freedom of religion in the New World had every reason to be uh, fearful and pessimistic, but they weren't. They were sure that everything was going to turn out just right, that they were going to get here safely and found a, a golden city on the hill that will be a model for all cities around the world. And that attitude has been the basis for this country ever since. Did you have you did you see the Vietnam special on public broadcasting? No. Oh boy, did you see it? I didn't. It's amazing. That famous filmmaker, what's his name? Oh, the guy that did the Civil War. Ken Burns. Burns. Uh, yeah. Did it. It was like yeah. ten. It was I, may, it may have been a ten-part series, mm -hmm. night after night, week after week. And uh, I don't think he was a student of uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, but he might as well have been, because he just shows how naive we were. We'd go into Vietnam, the people would uh, embrace us because they wanted to copy our notion of a golden city on a hill, and they'd make their their country into a democracy, and they'd be a, our friends and fight side by side with us and defeat the evil communists. And of course, uh, it didn't happen. And I suppose he made that special because he wanted to show us the connection between our attitude in Vietnam and our attitude in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and wherever we go. That wherever we go, Americans are going to be uh, embraced as heroes, and every country is going to want to uh, become a democracy, just like the United States. And they don't. Why? Because they can't. Why can't South Viet Why couldn't South Vietnam become a democracy like the United States? Because they have a different history than the United States. Right? Yeah. So would you say this optimism that Niebuhr talks about discounts history? I don't know what you mean. Like the optimists, do they not appreciate the, the history? The difference is the darkness. Well, that's a very important point that you're making, but they don't know. They 
not only discount history, they, dis they discount anything that would interfere with their sentimentality. History or otherwise. So do you think democracy is like the natural end for um, political um, government? For well, remember, the Tocqueville did. Yeah. He said everybody eventually become democratic because everybody eventually wants to go to Disney World and eat at McDonald's. And well, well like, like granted, you know, democracies can fail. But isn't, you know, every other... People want freedom and they want equality, and that's synonymous with democracy. But they have to progress at their own rate, right. given their given their own history. You can't jump from like feudalism straight to the economy. Well, you can't. I mean, the United back, States. So we can't come in and remember, we, we used to we used to talk over and over again about how what's known as the American Revolution actually is a misnomer. Because what the Americans did was make some reforms to the uh, to the English political system. The first reform, of course, was to get rid of a king, but we set up a very powerful chief executive in Washington who refused to be a king. We underwent a, rep a, re a revolution. By definition, is a 180 degree change, but politically economically and socially. The same people who were on top of the socioeconomic ladder in this country before the American Revolution were on top of the socioeconomic ladder after the American Revolution. The economics were the same, except that uh, we made money off our own natural resources rather than the English making money off our own natural resources. That's an important change, but that's not 180 change. And politically, we adopted the same values that the English have been developing for centuries. That's not to say that what happened in this country at the end of the 18th century was not significant. But we underwent a, a nationalistic war, not a true revolution. What would be a true revolution where they changed was 180 degrees. Between French, maybe? French, Chinese, Russian, etc. Of course. And they all failed initially, again, because they didn't progress. They tried to bring in a system that wasn't um, coherent with what they had experienced before. So that's the th he gets this third way, as you correctly said, from, from Christianity. Here's the third way, page 41. He says, um, the preservation of a democratic civilization requires the wisdom of the serpent, that's associated with the children of darkness, and the harmlessness of the dove associated with the children of light, the wisdom of the serpent and the harmlessness of the dove. The children of light must be armed with the wisdom of the children of darkness, but remain free from their malice. They must know the power of self-interest in human society without giving it moral justification. They must have this wisdom in order that they may beguile and deflect harness and restrain self-interest, individual and collective, for the sake of the community. That's really beautiful writing. Perhaps the most famous quotation in his book is found in the foreword on page 13. Here's what he says. Modern democracy requires a more realistic philosophical and religious basis, not only in order to anticipate and understand the perils to which it is exposed, but also to give it a more persuasive justification. And here's what he says. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's inclination to injustice 
makes democracy necessary. Let me, you want me to write that on the board? I love yeah. to write on the board. Yeah. Let's dissect this. see if we can figure out what this means. Because it sums up his third way, his third way very, very well. So the spiritual part, what he's saying is that the spiritual part of us that is as harmless as a dove allows us to value such freedoms as religion, speech, press, and assembly. Okay. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. There's a part of us that does honor those freedoms, and they are at the center of democratic government. But the shrewd part of us that includes the wisdom of the serpent limits the ability of power-hungry human beings in government who would seek to suppress those freedoms. That's his third way, and he gets it, he says, from Augustine's traditional Christian theology. Okay? Does that make any sense for you? Yeah. So they can't be, like, two really, really nice, like give you a thousand dollars nice, but they can't be two... You can give someone $1,000 if you have it, but you have to make it clear that uh, there are limits to my uh, generosity and don't try to take advantage of me. That's the point. Now, what are the um, techniques that we use in our government to make it very difficult for tyrants to uh, take away our freedom? Checks and balances. Well, of course. I mean, that's, you know, separation of powers and checks and balances. Yeah. And what we're hoping is that ultimately those, that separation of powers and checks, hope, we're hoping that ultimately that system will be, the, will result in the demise of uh, Trump. Because he really is dangerous to us. And, and because he's dangerous to us, he's dangerous to the whole world. Who set up that special prosecutor? Uh, Sessions, right? Isn't that amazing? Why did he do that? He's the attorney general. Yeah, but he, so you would expect him to do it, but he said it, that's what ticked Trump off because he said it would be a conflict of interest if I did it. Right. I don't know, I mean, I'm not so sure what the motivation was, whether it was to protect his butt or whether he did it for honorable purposes, but whatever the motivation, it may work out very well for Americans and the rest of the world. 